Today on Face the Nation, is health care reform dead or alive? And what about the controversy over the Harvard Scholar and the Cambridge Cup? The Senate won't make the August deadline to pass health care reform as President Obama wanted. Now there are huge problems in the House, not just with Republicans, but now with conservative Democrats. What happens next? We'll ask the top White House advisor, David Oxelrod, and one of the leading conservative Democrats, Jim Cooper of Tennessee. Then we'll turn to the issue that has consumed the headlines last week, the Gates controversy. We'll talk about that with Georgetown sociologist Michael Eric Dyson and columnist Kathleen Parker. I'll have a final word on what the president calls the teachable moment. Health care and the Gates controversy on Face the Nation. Face the Nation with CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer. And now from CBS News in Washington, Bob Schieffer. And good morning again. We begin this morning in Chicago with White House Senior Advisor David Axelrod. Mr. Axelrod, thank you for coming. I want to go straight to this uh, controversy of last week involving the uh, Harvard scholar Henry Louis Gates. I assume most people are generally aware of the situation. So I just want to ask you this. The president said that he talked to both the uh, Cambridge policeman, uh, Mr. Crowley, and he talked with Gates uh, on Friday. He wants them to both come to the White House. Is that, in fact, going to happen? Well, they both expressed interest. I, I expect that it will happen, yes. I think the president sees this as an opportunity to get dialogue going uh, on an issue that's had historic, uh, that's been historically troubling and one he's worked on. And, and they both seem very eager uh, to move forward, so I expect it will. When did the president realize that this thing was ballooning out of control and basically, as he said, that uh, what he had said had made it worse? Uh, well, he was traveling on Thursday. Uh, when he uh, uh, came to the office on Friday, he, um, you know, he expressed that view and said that um, he wanted to call, um, he wanted to call the, uh, Sergeant Crowley and uh, Professor Gates. and. Um, uh, once he made that decision, he, he and uh, the question came up, how are you going to read this out? How are you going to tell people about the call? He said, you know what, I'm just going to go out and, and say my piece on this. So, uh, you know, he made those decisions on uh, Friday morning. Well, obviously, when he said what he said in the news conference, he later came to realize that on reflection that maybe that was not the way to go. But I was just wondering, was there any particular incident the next day uh, that made him realize that uh, I need to get this straightened out? No, but I think Bob. He he certainly is a uh, you know he's aware of he he, he reads uh, widely. He you know gets summaries of coverage. He sees some coverage. Uh, I think he understood that the debate was veering off in uh, the wrong direction, and as he said, that his words may have contributed to that. So he felt a responsibility uh, to step forward and kind of cool uh, the situation down and acknowledge the fact that he had, as he said, calibrated his words. Uh, uh, poorly and uh, had contributed to that. So uh, that, that's what he did. And I think it's had the desired effect. I think people are talking more constructively now. I think the steam has gone out of this. And now, instead of heat being generated, maybe a little light will be generated off of this situation. And, and I want to go back. He, he did get assurances from both of them that they do want to meet and, and kind of talk this they, out. They, they, they expressed an interest in coming, uh, in, in coming to the White House. and. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, that will likely happen. Well, there's no question it took attention away from one thing that the president wanted to talk a lot about this week, and that was health care reform. Uh, let me ask you this, Mr. Uh, Axelrod, with conservative Democrats in the House now saying they just can't go along with what their leaders uh, want to do, uh, is the president ready to uh, scale uh, this whole operation back and bring it into line and, and more into line with what these conservative Democrats want to do? Because quite frankly, if you can't get this group of Democrats, you can't pass this bill. Well, Bob, first understand that there's agreement on probably 80 percent of these uh, issues. Uh, and the reason there's an agreement is because we've seen health premiums double in the last uh, 10 years, out-of-pockets go, uh, costs go up by a third, health care is going up three times the rate of wages, and this is an unsustainable uh, trend for, 
for families and businesses. Everybody, I think, uh, wants to get uh, something done. And now we're at that final 20 percent. We're trying to work uh, through those details. But uh, I think that uh, we're going to get there because this is a situation that is untenable for the American people moving forward. And within uh, the things that we're going to do are a vast uh, array of insurance reforms mm -hmm. uh, that have been long overdue that will help people. I mean, right now we have a system that works well for the insurance industry, but not particularly well for consumers of, uh, of health care and for the American people. Well, uh, we want to give them more security, and uh, I think that we'll succeed in doing that. Well, uh, uh, obviously the president's, uh, and it's been a, a, a strategy by design, uh, he has spoken mostly about principles he's wanted to achieve. Isn't the president going to have to get down to some specifics here, Mr. Axelrod, tell the Congress exactly what he is for, how he wants to pay for this, uh, how he wants to cut the costs that are going to have to be cut, uh, so that the Congress can know exactly what he's, he's talking about? Because some of the time here where you're, you're seeing some of these things where they're trying to get the House Democrats to sign off on things that the president haven't, hasn't even signed off on yet. Well, well, first of all, Bob, understand that we've been in almost daily, perhaps uh, dialogue hourly in the last few months uh, with uh, uh, members of the House and Senate on this. The president did lay out a very specific uh, array of... Uh, 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 of cuts and savings that will help finance most of this health reform, and those have been largely embraced okay. uh, by uh, everybody involved. So he is involved in the process and uh, will continue to be in steering in the right direction so well, that it lowers costs, improves quality of care, and, and, and gets us out from under the yoke of this uh, inexorable right. climb in, uh, in health care costs. But just tell me, give me some specifics on how the president wants to pay for this. We heard him say at the news conference the other night, he's now ready uh, to consider uh, a surtax on people in the very upper income brackets, those who make uh, over a half million dollars. Uh, is he ready, as Mike Allen, uh, Politico's crack reporter, reports today, ready to uh, tax some of the most expensive, uh, what he calls gold-plated Cadillac insurance policies? Is he ready to do that? Well, Mike is a crack reporter, but the president actually was asked this uh, the other day uh, uh, by uh, Jim Lair, and what he said was, that this was an you know that there was uh, this was an intriguing idea to put an excise tax on high end uh, health care policies like the ones that the the uh, executives at Goldman Sachs have the forty thousand dollar policies. His big interest is in keeping the yoke of this, the burden of this, off of the middle class who are struggling in this uh, economy. If uh, if it if it meets that test, uh, then uh, he'll he'll uh, he'll certainly give it. Uh, consideration. So I, I think that's certainly a possibility. But there are other possibilities out there as well. Uh, I just want to go back to, to, to my previous question. And by the way, Bob, the, you, you, let, but I want, I, want to, I want to respond to your previous question by saying the President laid out a specific proposal uh, on this, which was uh, after all the cuts that he's proposed that will pay for most of this, cuts in, in, in unwarranted subsidies to the insurance okay. industry and so on, he said, he said that uh, we ought to uh, cap the deductions for the very wealthiest Americans uh, on their taxes, and uh, that's a proposal that he believed in. Others in Congress had a different yeah. view, so we're having a dialogue about that. But uh, just one question. Uh, how can you get House Democrats to sign off on something that all you will say about it is, well, that's an intriguing idea? I mean, isn't he going to have to say, look, fellas, if you'll do this, I I'm ready to do this. Because it had to if there's go, well, Bob, go ahead. If, if there's a con if there's a consensus uh, for uh, an idea and and uh, uh, people are looking for his uh, view on it, he will give them that view. That consensus hasn't uh, emerged yet. That's why people have been working all weekend long, day and night uh, on this, and will into uh, this week and next. So uh, you know, I I'm sure that this process will move along. The fact is, everyone's focused on the fact that we have some issues left to resolve. Uh, we've made enormous progress on this, and I think that, that we will continue to do that. And we, we're yes. on target to uh, get something done in the fall on this, which has always been uh, you know, our goal. Why not say to the Congress, look, this is so important. I think you fellows ought to cancel your uh, August uh, vacation, and if you'll cancel yours, I'll cancel mine. Well, I think if, uh, if the uh, view was that that would improve our chances of getting something done, 
I'm sure the president uh, would be willing to do that. That's a, that's a calculation that has to be uh, made. The important thing is that, uh, uh, is that, that a possibility move, uh, that we continue to move forward? Is that a possibility? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's unlikely that that will happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to prejudge. This is also okay. a question for the leaders. I think that we are making good progress. I think we are on track to get something done. These are complex issues. We're having a good, uh, uh, thorough All discussion right. about them because we, because we don't want to put speed ahead of uh, doing this right. And, and everybody, I think, agrees on that. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Axelrod. And uh, we turn now to Congressman Jim Cooper, who is one of those conservative Democrats. He's uh, at his home in Nashville, Tennessee this morning. Well, I guess we couldn't blame Mr. Axelrod uh, for not canceling the president's vacation this morning on television. <laughs> he probably wouldn't uh, keep his job very long if he did that. But do you want more specifics, uh, Congressman Cooper? Yes, Bob, we do. Uh, it's very important that every American understand this plan because it's so vital it's about how their doctor or hospital treats them, and that's what this issue has got to do. We want more White House leadership. Now, they have been increasingly good at this. We're, they're more and more engaged. But the real question is not about uh, uh, authorship. It's more about craftsmanship, a bill that works. And the president's laid down excellent guidelines. We are for reform. We want a good bill to pass this year, and I think that can, be, that can happen. But as of right now, uh, Speaker Pelosi has said that when she takes the bill to the floor for a vote, that she will have the votes to pass it. Can she take to that, that bill to the floor next week yet? Does she have the votes yet to pass it? I don't believe so next week. I think that the American people want to take a closer look at this legislation. They want to feel comfortable with it. And I think most members of the House and Senate want the same thing. Uh, we're still in the earliest stages of drafting reform. We have a, a long way to go. A lot of agreement is out there, and I think David Axelrod is right. We have agreement on 70 or 80 percent of the legislation, but it's important we get the other details right, too. Well, because the other details are who's going to pay for it and, uh, <laughs> and how are you going to cut the cost. What do you want here, uh, Congressman? What if you went to the White House or if the president called you on the phone uh, after you were on television here this morning? What would you tell him about what needs to happen here? Well, there are two approaches. We can try to amend the current bills that are in Congress, and that's a possibility. Or there are other approaches that are completely bipartisan and introduced and actually score well, according to the Congressional Budget Office. They save money and they cover everyone. One of these is called the Healthy Americans Act, introduced by Ron Wyden and Bob Bennett. Another approach is the one that former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle came up with, with Bob Dole. So there are other alternative approaches that I think Congress should be allowed to consider. But if we're just amending the current legislation, it's really important that we get into the details and make sure they work in every state in this great country. And there are ways to do that because there are excellent models of health care delivery all over the country, places like the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota that do a superb job. Almost every state has one of these outstanding models. And if we just allowed them to grow a little bit more, and as the president has said repeatedly, if we just make health insurance more affordable and more available for everybody, then I think it's going to be health care reform that everybody can get behind. Well, uh, what about this idea uh, that's apparently being talked about, at least in the White House now, of uh, putting a tax on the more expensive health insurance programs, the so-called uh, Cadillac plans? Would that be something you could vote for? Well, Bob, that's a very interesting and promising new development in the discussions. I think the better way to describe it is like this. First of all, this is a free country. You should be able to buy whatever health insurance you want to with your own money. But you should not be able to force your fellow taxpayers to subsidize your choice of these super luxury plans. We're reading about one today from Goldman Sachs. That's $40,000 per family. That's fine if you want to buy that with your own money, but you shouldn't be able to force poor and middle income taxpayers to subsidize your decision to buy that policy. And a lot of folks don't understand today's very complex tax system which does, in fact, subsidize the policies for the highest income people in America and really doesn't give much of a tax break at all to regular working Americans. So I think there's a way to make that tax system a lot fairer than it has been in the past. Is it possible to cut health care costs? Uh, I talk to doctors that say, look, uh, the costs are going up. They're not going down. Is it realistic to say that you can actually make substantial cuts in how much this costs? Bob, you've asked the key question right there, and I think the best way to put it is what we really need to do is slow the rate of growth of health spending. It's been growing at inflation plus 2.5% for 30 or 40 years. If we can just get it down to the growth of inflation, 
That would solve some two-thirds of our entitlement problems in the future. But there's resistance to that because a lot of the healthcare sector has grown so fat and happy on the extra money, they don't know how to just live on an inflationary adjustment. So I think we can reform the system, but so much of medicine is cultural, and it's very difficult for government to get at. The excellent New Yorker article by Atul Gawande on the difference between McAllen, Texas, and El Paso, Texas. McAllen, Texas being the highest spending healthcare area in America. And this all developed in the last 15 years due to a practice pattern in McAllen that is very, very wasteful. So what we want is good value. Every American wants to live longer and healthier. We can do that and save a bunch of money. The estimate is that we're currently wasting every year some $700 billion. And that's billion with a B, Bob. That's a lot of money. All right. If we can just save a fraction of that, we can solve the problems. Congressman Jim Cooper acknowledged as one of the real experts on this whole issue yeah. in the House. We'll be right. back in just one minute. And with us now to talk about this controversy over the Cambridge cop and the Harvard scholar, Michael Eric Dyson of Georgetown University, among other things, a biographer of Barack Obama, a sociologist who's written a lot about politics and sociology, and Kathleen Parker, the syndicated columnist, uh, I would say it's fair to say conservative columnist mm -hmm. of the Washington Post, although she is ambidextrous, she tells me. <laughs> <laughs> what should we make of this, Michael? Well, obviously, it was a flare-up along a bigger trajectory of race in American society. Uh, the disagreement, the disgruntlement, uh, this, the disconcerning um, evidence of racial and class hostility between Sergeant Crowley and Professor Gates and the president getting involved. And what I love about him, he's a, he's a principal gentleman. He says, look, I ratcheted it up. I admit that I did this mea culpa. Let me try to help figure this out. I think we've got to focus beyond the persona and the personalities here to the bigger issues. Racial profiling is real. Disproportionate concentration of black and Latino men in prison is real. The death penalty being unfair to many people is real. So I think we have to have a broader conversation about race. And Eric Holder, the attorney general, suggested to us during black history that we have been a nation of cowards when it comes to race. Uh, he was widely booed and some people reviled him. Now his words have come to haunt us and they appear to be prescient. So I think that what we have to do is to have open, honest conversation on all sides without prejudging the situation, but to suggest at the same time, Bob, that look, there are some big problems here. Uh, if Mr. Crowley and Mr. Gates go join Mr. Obama in the White House and have a beer, that's great. But w we haven't done what, get to what ails us. And what ails us are structural problems. And the president, by the way, has the bully pulpit to talk about this in a more powerful way. I think he's been loathe or at least reluctant to speak about it. I think he should dive right into it. And secondly, he should change some of the policies that actually affect black and brown men uh, once they go to prison, the harsh penalties that they, they endure. I think all of that kind of stuff, if, that, that is that, if that, that's where it leads us, I'm sorry, that's going to have a huge effect that is very edifying on the American conversation. Will it? Well, it's going to be interesting. I agree with so much of what he said, and, and you know, I, because of my introduction, I suppose I'm supposed to present some conservative view, <laughs> or I'm because of my skin color, I'm supposed to see the white view, but I, I you know, this is not a, a clear-cut black and white issue, I don't think. In right. fact, the ambidextrous conversation had to do with the fact that I could argue both sides fairly passionately. Uh, this conversation about race desperately needs to take place. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama is uniquely positioned to advance that conversation. Um, I think he, he, he stepped in it a little bit. You know, when he got up at that first press conference and said the police acted stupidly, um, but first by prefacing it, saying, well, I don't really know the facts and I am biased, but, you know, Barack Obama was doing what, um, I think he was being the person, Obama, and forgetting momentarily that he's the President Obama and everything he says matters. But he did do the right thing, coming mm -hmm. back and saying, look, I did make this worse. I'm sorry I made it worse. He didn't say I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. indicated as much. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that was kind of remarkable in itself. I can never recall, and maybe one of you can, a president actually saying, I made this worse. I, I thought it's, that was a very yeah. interesting it's, moment you know, in, if he got the, in the history of the American presidency. If yeah. he got the press conference question, can you think of anything you've ever done wrong or either you regret it or that right. it was a mistake? he would not have trouble thinking up something to say. It, which is remarkable. I mean, yeah. that is an indication, I think, of profound leadership, of a depth of integrity, and at least the willingness to acknowledge, if I'm going to ask the American people to do some stuff, I've got to be willing to say that I was wrong myself. And I think, but look, I, I think that Kathleen is right. Uh, when you look at Barack Obama, it did have a, a sense of flashback, you know, mm -hmm. because many black men 
have endured this particular problem. I mean, I'm a professor at Georgetown, got a PhD from Princeton, but I was stopped by the cops in New Jersey, and when I told them I was working on a PhD at three o'clock in the morning, had me walk a line, I'm a teetotaler and a Baptist preacher, I don't drink, he said, yeah, and I'm the blanking president of the United States. I mean, <laughs> the kind of disparaging and humiliating remarks made yeah. by police people toward uh, African-American Latino men. I don't think there's a moral equivalency here. That is to say, police people with big guns going into your house or accosting you on the street are not equal to people who get mad and outraged that they've been stopped. Most black men would never say what Professor Gates allegedly said, according to Sergeant Crowley. We're too scared. I've had white people that I've been with who wouldn't stop got out of the car and cursed the police. I took cover because I knew a hail of bullets <laughs> was about to come. Let me ask <coughs> Kathleen, let's suppose this had been two women. Would this have happened? Uh, <laughs> well, no, I don't think so. I think we do have, uh, there's a little, there's a male aspect to this. There's a mm -hmm. pride aspect to mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Guys are going to go head to head. They're going to say, look, oh yeah, well, I'll right. show you, buddy. Right. Your mama, oh right. yeah, well, I've got the guns <coughs> and the handcuffs, so mm -hmm. we'll show you who's boss. You know, that's a Males take it to a different level. I don't think it would have been the same thing. And I would, I would say that once I was, since we're trading personal stories, I was pulled once by a female, uh, black female um, traffic cop. Mm. And I got a little feisty. It was about 100 degrees. I was tired. I had a toddler in the seat. And I didn't mm. think I was speeding. And I wanted to argue. And she indicated to me that if I didn't adjust my attitude, I'd be going to jail. Right. And so I adjusted my attitude. <laughs> it was yeah. a pretty simple thing. Yeah. And, you know, it if we're going to get right down to the bottom line in this case i want to say that the the man with the gun and the handcuffs and the power is the man who says right. we made a mistake see you later or you right. know go ahead and let him have a piece of your mind if you want to but walk away but look at it this way too if that had been not uh professor gates but henry kissinger another harvard professor and george bush the president and he said that's my friend and a black sergeant arrested him he'd be doing traffic duty right now the police union would not stand behind him. And I think we'd have a much more different understanding and interpretation. So these things do make a difference. Class makes a difference. Race makes a difference. Testosterone makes well, a difference. Well, and that class distinction <coughs> needs to be talked about, too, because when Professor Gates said, do you know who I am, mm -hmm. you've got a black intellectual saying to a working class white guy, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more important than you are. You know, that sets up a whole nother set of sparks. But we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. and we've decided that not only should we be invited to this White House encounter, <laughs> but uh, what would be interesting, the way you get to the truth is you have the opposite sides defend the person <laughs> they're least likely to defend. You argue for the white cop, I'll <laughs> argue for the black intellectual. Well, what's interesting as well <laughs> is that the class issue comes out this way too. It took a president and a Harvard professor to gin up enough pedigree and social status to argue against what is usually taken for the law, a white policeman. That's a class matter, too, that has to be dealt with. Right. I'm going to speak for the timekeeper here. <laughs> okay. Our time is up. Thank you both so Thanks much. I'll us. be back with my own take on all this in just a second. Finally today, the president said he hoped the Gates incident would provide a teachable moment, and for sure it was no shining moment for any of those involved. A scholar who popped off after a long day, which included locking himself out of his own house. But then we've all been there, haven't we? A cop trained not to let such things bother him, let some smart remarks get under his skin. Inexcusable, sure, but aren't cops human too sometimes? And a president who should have remembered but forgot just how bully the bully pulpit can be. But then he had a couple of things on his mind that day too, didn't he? Finally, the president did what presidents, or anyone for that matter, seldom do. He admitted a mistake. He said he realized that what he had said just made things worse. That made me think. If the cop had told the scholar, sorry, I didn't mean to insult you when I asked you for identification. I was just trying to do the job you pay me to do. Or if the scholar had told the cop, you know, I shouldn't have popped off. It's just been a long, hard day. My guess, if they had said that, none of this would have even made the local news. We all have bad days, no one's perfect, and when we're willing to step back, take a breath, and admit that, or at least concede the other guy may have a point, it generally makes things better. To me, that's the lesson here. That's our broadcast. See you next week, right here on Face the Nation.